Hi, thanks so much for joining us. Uh, my name is Thomas Johnson. I'm the Curator of Performance and Moving Image at Dunlop Art Gallery and RPL Film Theatre. And uh, happy to welcome you here to my kitchen, uh, located here on Oxcana Kasatake, also known as Pile of Bones, also known as Regina. Uh, just happy to give a bit more of a tour. Uh, last week, we or last visit, we had a tour of my house. This is a bit of a tour of the kitchen. And just a few artworks here. This is a piece by uh, Cheryl Rondell, uh, which we like just as a reminder of the importance of a good kitchen uh, chat. Uh, and then uh, this piece here in acknowledgement of my uh, heritage as a first generation uh, Danish settler. This is uh, from Freetown Christiania, a site that's under uh, um, real estate uh, pressures uh, as a former um, real estate free zone. So I'd like to um, read from this uh, recipe book, which uh, we'll be setting the course for our discussion today, uh, for Kitchen Party, which is the final celebration of diptychs, UTC4, UTC7, a collaborative video project initiated by Johanna Householder and Judith Price, and collaborating artists, Seth Cardinal Dodging Horse, Jeannie Randolph, Anne Bourne, Rita McCo, Jay Kovac, Leos Kaiser, and Jeff Morton. Uh, each of the videos that they produced are available uh, online and can be seen at Dunlop Art Gallery's YouTube page. And for tonight's uh, discussion, we're joined by artists Jay Kovac, Rita McCo, and Jeff Morton, who will be in conversation and in performance with each other. I welcome you to contribute to this dialogue uh, via the chat to the right of your screen. Uh, we'll have the opportunity to bring questions up towards the end. And I encourage you, if you haven't yet spent time with the works, uh, please visit them. Uh, today or uh, following uh, the discussion, uh, and which can also be seen at the Dunlop's Digital Lounge at Regina Public Library Central location. And now I'd like to introduce our uh, hosts, Judith and Johanna. Johanna Householder works at the intersection of popular and unpopular culture, making performance art, audio, video, and film and choreography. Her interests in how ideas move through bodies has led her to often collaborative practice. She's performed across Canada and in, at international venues for 40 years. One of the founders of the 7A11D International Festival of Performance Art, she's co-edited two books with Tanya Mars, Caught in the Act, an anthology of performance art by Canadian women, and more Caught in the Act. She's a professor of emeritus, professor emeritus at OCADU, where she taught performance and time-based media. Her current work concerns the vexations of the Anthropocene. Also joining us is Judith Price, who combines a 30 plus year of transdisciplinary art practice with a background in modern dance. Her body of work includes performances, performative videos, video installations, site-specific installations, and short films. Her performances include site-specific street actions, interventions, and collaborative and durational works and her solo performances in galleries and festival events incorporate still Im images, video projection, and sculpture, merging performance and video installation. She's a founding member of the Open Actions Performance Collective and lives in Victoria, BC, and is retired from teaching post-secondary courses in time-based art. Welcome, Johanna and Judith. Thank you so much, Thomas. Thank you. You're such a performer, such a performance artist, actually. <laughs> And and that kind of leads into what we want to talk about first. We just wanted to give people a bit of a background to the project overall. And then we're going to talk first with Jay. We'll see clips of each of the videos that, uh, uh, that they contributed to. So we'll talk with Jay and then Rita and then Jeff. And then we hope to have a jam at the end. And it's possible, I'm not sure how we landed ended up with Eric who's in the background, everyone, Eric is the tech coordinator who's doing everything that you can see. <clears throat> and uh, it's possible we might be able to open the jam up to everyone who uh, is here tonight. Um, I just wanted to uh, situate myself on the so-called uh, Treaty 13 territory, Takaranto, and to remind people that even here in uh, bucolic Ontario uh, land struggles are still going on and very near <clears throat> Toronto, just on the outskirts in Caledon, um, 1492 Landback Road. 
uh, check that out, check out uh, their Facebook. They have uh, a lot of posts on Facebook and they have an ongoing uh, fundraising for their defense fund. So I just wanted to point people in that direction. Um, Judy? Yes, and I'm out here on the West Coast. Um, I'm living and working as an uninvited guest on the ancestral lands of the Esquimalt, the Lekwunga, and the Songhees, and the Wasonic peoples. And I want to just kind of want to mention that they are unceded territories, as none of these people have ever signed treaties with the government, which is pretty um, much the way it is on the West Coast in general. So. Okay, so one of the things that we <clears throat> wanted to talk about tonight, and one of the reasons that we feel like situating ourselves is so important, is because we are in this ethereal um, space of Zoom, which obliterates time zones and geographies. <clears throat> and so we wanted to want to always reintroduce the, the idea that we're actually are somewhere, even though we're also nowhere and that nowhereness has played a big role in our uh, in this project um and my earlier observation that you're such a performer judy and i were having a discussion before this about how in a sense this these videos and this work has been an extension of of a well-known genre of performance art, uh, which is performance for the camera. <clears throat> but in the case of Zoom and our laptops, the camera is almost invisible. Mm -hmm. I mean, it kind of is invisible. Um, so, so in a sense, we're performing for the screen or for each other, really, that was where this started. And yeah, on the on the performance performance for camera always always posits that there's a camera and there's a, perf a an artist performing and it's in a specific place and and when Johanna and I um, and both because both of us have this background in performance art and in dance and we when we started um, getting together on Zoom and and realized that we were we were here where there we are together. And we are 3,000 miles apart, but we're together in the same, it looks like we're in the same place, uh, but we're not even in the same time. But here we are and we're together. And, and, and it's kind of like our, it, all of this has been kind of, as jo Johanna says, research. And we have used, um, we have used um, Zoom, used the, the uh, technology in a way to, um, to bring to bring together um, our research with our studio practice, in that um, this is like a studio that we are in, and and people are in it can be in it with us. So, Johanna, back to you. Yeah. So, so we began very early on to notice the differences and similarities by what. Judy refers to as our mise-en-scene, our surroundings and, and the architecture. Um, and that's why we're in our kitchens now because that became a, one of the episodes of these uh, numerous episodes that we actually recorded. Um, that recording in a sense was the, was the impetus for the, for the, for the action <clears throat> because Without the action, you know, performance for camera is often a recording of a specific action. And I just want to say here that one of the, um, what, what do I, what, what do I call her? One, one of the, uh, I, I don't know. Anyway, Angelo, my partner pointed out to me that, uh, uh, when we were talking about Kitchen Party, uh, he mentioned Martha Rossler's Semiotics of the Kitchen, which, of course, hadn't even occurred to me. But now that it has been pointed out, it's just so much about that. Uh, and, and so Judy and I began uh, reading each other's spaces, in a sense, <clears throat> mm -hmm. and moving around uh, the architecture, uh, both the macro architecture, you know, the the cupboards and the 
and the door handles. Um, and then uh, the micro or architecture, the, the handles, the, the fridge magnets that we share, the, um, the teapots and the tea kettles um, for the kitchen party episode. And then other common um, elements asserted themselves as we moved through our houses over the last year, um, beginning in, you know, during the lock, major lockdown period in 2020, and then moving through 2020 and 2021. Um, and then deciding to collabor collaborate with, um, with sound artists. Yeah, which, which, which came out of our, our um, connection with Thomas. And, um, and he talked about um, po the possibility of, of working with sound artists. And we had already um, used, a, a, had a, a one episode that had some um, sound, a sound artist worked with. And it just seemed like it just expanded. It just, the whole thing just expanded. And all of the, all of the, um, all of the things that we were exploring, all of the architecture, all of the, all of the items that were in our homes that seemed like sometimes they they'd match, they'd almost merge, and sometimes they they'd be quite different. All of these were because of the sound. They they it it just so much enhanced the action that we were doing. And and yeah, we use the um, we use the the platform to to. Um, engage we to uh, for us to engage in our practice but our practice expanded um, as the as the sound artist became a part of it and so it's um yeah it's been quite wonderful quite amazing i think uh it might be time for some tea oh yeah would you like a cup of tea i would yeah you have some Okay. Oh, oh what a nice cup. Yeah, great. Okay. Here you go, Johanna. Tea. Oh, wow. Thanks. Is it hot enough? I'll let it cool a little bit. <laughs> Yeah. Thanks. You're welcome. I have some too. Something went wrong with my cup on the way, but. <laughs> <laughs> Looks like it's got, uh, you yeah, know, video feedback. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay, so it looks like next we have uh, the clip, which is uh, by. Um, uh, Leo Kaiser and uh, Jay Kovac, uh, who will be uh, we'll be watching now. So we'll just take a few minutes to take a look at that. Yeah. So this is from the episode that we actually titled "Kitchen Party." Mm -hmm. Jay, welcome. <clears throat> Thanks. <laughs> so how is it where you are? <clears throat> um, it is pretty chilly um, outside. I am in uh, Oscana, Kasistucky, um, or Regina, Saskatchewan. 
um, <clears throat> on Treaty 4 territory. And you're having a blizzard? Yes, apparently. It hasn't started yet, but we'll, we'll, we'll see. <laughs> okay, good luck with that. Yeah. I wanted to say how how every time that um, every time I see that um, tomato being thrown in the yeah I laugh every time I still laugh it I the, it it's so playful the sound track the sound for that episode is just so playful it's and it and it's so kitchen like too <laughs> yeah yeah we um. Playing around was uh, part of what we did to make the soundtrack. Uh, I would record some stuff and I would send it to Leo, um, the other member of Homo Monstrous, and um, they would kind of respond and send it back. And that's kind of how we built our our track for the for the video. And did you use some of the? Well, you did use some of the original sound from the video but yeah one of the that was one of the things i started out with um right. mm -hmm. i ran it through um a bunch of filters and stuff and made it weird <laughs> so you can still hear the original voice but mm -hmm. then there's kind of like this weird melodicness that happens to it and the kind of noise and stuff that will be triggered by by uh the talking and, and also each, um, it's kind of like each, not only just each action, but each object seems to take on its own sound. Excuse me. Yeah, yeah, a little bit. That was one of the things I remember we were talking about trying yeah. to. It, it really, it really works well, like they, because they're, it's like this kitchen peopled with all these, all these sounds that come out of all these objects that are in the kitchen and. Yeah. And it's really fun. Yeah. Yeah. That was one of the. We're so used to Leo and I making um, music and tracks that are more uh, don't really we don't really respond to video that often. So it was a nice challenge to uh, think about how we could kind of tailor our sounds to different objects and uh, kind of bring them to life that way. Yeah, I still. Um, I mean, I I remember that process this was about a year ago actually that we yeah were, it was quite we a while ago doing this uh yeah you were the and we hadn't met before until we met on zoom yeah so mm -hmm. as much as we uh love to hate zoom it really enabled this entire body of work so yeah uh we do we do owe it that debt of uh enabling a kind of collaboration that probably might not might never have taken place um, but what I loved was the kind of ex back and forth exchange that we got to have by sending, sending mm -hmm. clips and then, you know, and then I, there was another exchange that was going on in the background that we didn't see between you and Leo and then coming back and responding to that again. And, and I remember asking for a little bit more, uh, perhaps iciness in the refrigerator. Yeah. And, uh, mm -hmm. I think you know, everyone could hear that um, happening, even though I was twiddling the hot sauces. Um, there was, <laughs> you know, you still got that fe that feeling of crystals forming. Yeah. Somehow. Um, uh, I, I actually would like you to talk a little bit more about Homo Monstrous because we know who you are, but there might be people who mm -hmm. are coming in who actually don't know about Homo Monstrous. Cool. Uh, Homo Monstrous is my like long standing collaboration with Leo. Um, I guess we're also, we are also a band, so we play shows. Um, we haven't been as active as we once were. Uh, COVID kind of changed that yeah. for yeah. us. Um, and we were in the middle of recording an album right before COVID. So we still don't have that done and I'm not sure what the, pl the plan is, but yeah, we've been collaborating together for 10 years and it's been awesome. It's something that I keep on returning to, so. <laughs> well, and it, it was when we heard, um, cause Thomas sent us 
um, you know, some sound from mm -hmm. the launches. And when we heard that, that's when we both went, oh, this is, this is perfect. Yeah, this is kick ass. This is <laughs> what we need. Nice. Yeah, yeah, it was like, yes. So it, it was like, um, yeah, it was just everything, everything that, that you and Leo did just um, expanded the, the, the video um, a lot. You know, that it, 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 it has so many layers. Mm -hmm. the layers are just, they've added so many layers to what was already there. So, yeah. Uh, that's great to hear. Um, I really like how the collaboration turned out. Yeah. Um, it's <laughs> is funny, but also a little bit spooky. And <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, it has a little bit of a weird kind of. Yeah, it has yeah. a little bit of a sci-fi edge to it, maybe. Yeah. <laughs> well, it is eerie. I I feel like there is a kind of um, uh, uncanniness to, yeah. especially you know, which of course we're we're constantly kind of pushing a little bit with the with the fact that we do seem to somehow inhabit a continuous household that's populated with the same objects. Yeah. And it makes me think how much how much more we are like ants or bees or something than than you know we think humans are so unique and special but in fact in every human <laughs> Households that there are not in, but there are many of the things you know the sink, yeah. the stove, the fridge, and and the and that what and that it seemed like it felt like we were kind of breaking, or breaking through the screen, breaking through yeah. the edge to to continue that that merging, or that yeah. similarity. Yeah, that's one thing I really love about the video: the moments where you'll pass something across the cameras together, or. Uh, throw the tomato yeah yeah that was really the first time that we started to uh try to you know experiment with breaking that uh yeah. breaking the screen mm -hmm. <clears throat> and in the and in the piece uh in jeff's work that you will be at the end you know we try to leave entirely yeah <laughs> push push that you know we if it's too bad um computers aren't rubber <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, totally. Because we probably would be a little bit more, even more adventurous with what we with, <laughs> would try to do with them. But uh, yeah. yeah, yeah, I guess soon enough they'll be <clears throat> waterproof. And yeah, I would imagine yeah. <laughs> someday. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, what are you up to now, Jay? Um. Well, I'm working on this project called the Capacitor Project for the University of Saskatchewan Art Galleries and Collection. Um, and basically what we are doing is giving four trans artists with a connection to Saskatchewan $2,000 um, a month for six months. So we're in our uh, application collecting phase. Wow. And I'm also doing a bunch of other art things and uh, music stuff. So it's been, it's been a good time. <laughs> yeah. And you have work currently at the Dunlop, right? Yeah. I have uh, some photographs that are part of in my skin. Right. Right. Yeah. And can folks see those? Yeah. They're on display at the gallery. Um, and I believe there will be photos of the work up on Dunlop learning as well. Okay, great. Yeah. So great. they'll be available to an online audience as well as uh, those who can come visit the gallery. Oh, that's great. <laughs> Correct. Dunlop Learning. Dot CA. Dot CA. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Eric just popped that in the chat. <laughs> and are you making music? Sound? Um, yeah, I actually have a show okay. tomorrow with my other band, Forced Fam. Um, oh, it's our first time playing in about six months. To a yeah, live audience? Pardon? You're going to be live? Yeah, this is going to be um, at the Exchange in Regina. Um, so it's a pretty big venue, um, and we're not expecting a ton of people to come out, but it'll be nice to actually perform in front of an audience again. I, I guess it depends on how much it snows. Yeah. That's true. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
And are you and Leo working on something too? Um, not really at the moment, other than that album that uh, we still haven't really talked about what to do with. Um, right. So we have some we have some work to do in the future. <laughs> well, I hope it gets finished. Yeah, me too. Be part way done and then not be able to. Finish yeah, it. I think we mostly just have to add vocals. So I think right. it would be doable to. Who does the vocals? Uh, both of us. Oh, both of you. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> cool. I'm really excited for that show, and I hope that I'm not snowed in. We'll be able to check that out. And anyone that's uh, within the Regina area, uh, I'm pleased to present our next guest. Uh, okay. Continuing the theme of uh, kick ass okay. collaborators, we have uh, Rita McCo, and so we'll be watching her clip now. Hi, Rita. Hi. <laughs> How are you both? Good. Yeah, I think I'm going to change the scene a little bit. <clears throat> um, okay. I want to talk about the oscillator. Oh, that's the oscillator. Okay. Okay. The, this, first of all, so wonderful to work with you both, and uh, I hadn't really done a soundtrack for a video before, so I was uh, right. um, yeah, it was really exciting. But after watching the video, I was really taken with um, the kind of compression of the space and the kind of intensity of being in that square of the camera's gaze, and and uh, yeah. I've just been wanting to learn how to make an oscillator, so I made this little uh, eight channel. Uh, analog oscillator made out of transistors. It's and it's got different capacitors mm -hmm. in it to make different sounds. And I uh, was really excited to uh, have a chance to build it for the piece and then to use it. So it's this. It's the main thing I used for the soundtrack. And I did lots and lots of layers and then added vocals. Uh, some of the vocals were residue that I found on the video and just amplified it and layered it and you know affected it and uh, and then uh, layering the oscillator different many 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 layers and kind of doing effects to it and really, really trying to capture that sense of uh, compression and intensity. And But I was really excited because um, I've been uh, really interested in learning how to make my own uh, drum machines and step sequencers and also, so this was really a you know, motivator to get me going and to get started. But there's a great uh, uh, artist, musician, really great young guy named uh, Look Mom No Computer from England his name is Sam Battle, and he has a great website, and he shares all his schematics and videos of how to make it. So it was really exciting to actually get to make it. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, and I worked on the piece. Uh, I'm actually currently living in, in Mokinsis, which is in Treaty 7, which is Calgary. And um, it's, uh, I worked on mainly the project there, and it's the main the traditional territory of the Blackfoot Confederacy, which is this uh, Siksika, the Kani, and the Kainai. It's also a traditional territory for the Stony Nakoda, uh, the Chiniki, the Bearspaw, and the Wellesley Nations, and the Tutsina Nation, also Métis region number three. And then when I was working on the video, I went to Nova Scotia to my little uh, place I stay in the summer sometimes, and that's the incredibly beautiful land. And it's, uh, 
the completely unceded territory of the Mi'kmaq people. And uh, it's with great respect and gratitude that I worked in both of these places and, and completed this work. And I was uh, really super uh, excited to work with you both and to have a chance to work on this piece. Thank you. Thank you for that. Thank you for, for thank you for sharing all of that. Seth, the Cardinal Dodging Horse, who also did one is yeah. uh, to, for, in, from the, or on Tutsina, is that's right. Tutsina. Yeah. That's right. yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It, yeah. So uh, we were going back and forth with with Rita sending her the video clips. Honestly, this episode, which I hope everyone will will watch, is one in which we we don't appear at all. In fact, we're it's called object lesson. And as you saw from the clip, there are <clears throat> we are literally in our kind of in our in my case, in my office. Well, we were both in our offices, but we have like everyone so many things just cluttering up uh, things people have given us toys, things artists, uh, you know, students have made uh, postcards, you know, random, random objects. And, and Rita, your work is so object uh, oriented. Mm -hmm. And you give life to the objects and, yeah, yeah. and also the creatures, I would say, in, yeah. in your in your own, um, you know, sculptural. Uh, um, what do I want to call them? Landscapes. Yeah. <laughs> um, that you, it just seemed. Who who could do that? Who could yeah. who could make sounds for these creatures? And it was like, well. Rita McCo could do this. Oh, yeah. So uh, we were so happy when you said yes. And um, and then halfway through the, you know, we were emailing back and forth and, and you're going like, oh, sorry, I haven't been answering my emails. I've been building an instrument for this project. <laughs> yeah. And that was um, pretty incredible. So I'm so happy you got a chance to yeah to yeah. build that and it's a beautiful thing. Can you show it again? Yeah, yeah, yeah. it's just, uh, it uses a technique called the reverse avalanche oscillators. So just, uh, yeah, it's really a simple thing, but I love the sound of it. The reason I like it so much is because it drifts. Like it, each of those each of those knobs is a different capacitor and it, it, you pick it, you set, set it on something, but then it drifts slightly and it kind of falls into these beautiful dissonant locations, which you, I don't think you could, I don't feel that it, you know, it's, you're not controlling it completely. It kind of drifts and it makes these really beautiful kind of chords and stuff, which I think is um, really beautiful that it just happens. It becomes like kind of an object itself, part of the piece in a way, right? And, yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. Can you play it now? Uh, I could. A little um, bit? Yeah, sure. Just a demo. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I should keep my eye on the time. Can you hear it? No, no. Not now. There it is. Could you hear it okay? Yeah, Paint, but no. oh, okay, all right. Still. <laughs> cool. Yeah, and it was very exciting. And um, just to explain, like what I did first was I really enjoyed watching the video over and over again. I heard little tiny fragments of things in there, but then I got really looking at those the objects being within that really small space, and I thought, you know, they're really the. I wanted to amplify the, the architectural details, like the fans and the motors, and that's why it sounds quite industrial and vibrating. And then there's also the longing the objects have to to talk with the viewer and to talk with each other and to connect and and also the limitations of the space become a place where they kind of articulate a kind of a relationship to the space. So what I ended up doing is as you, as you got you both know Judith and Joanna was kind of giving them each listening to them and trying to hear what they were talking about and what was worrying them the most or what was triggering them and and. Uh, so I went that little up in the clip that you showed, there's that little white shape with those long, thin wires sticking out of it. And what I heard from that object was it said, 
you know, talking about the space and being in two dimensional space and being confined and on Zoom, it said, it's totally nerve wracking. It puts me on edge. The space is so small. Everything seems flat and there's no sense of space anymore. So just this kind of idea of living in this almost two dimensional world that the screen represents. And then the orange duct tape at the beginning, there's a sock, if anybody watched it. And uh, this came from a residue of Johanna's voice that was on there and it said, it's like the orange sock, it's wrapped in pink duct tape and it's like panting and it says, my body is two things at once, one opening, room for a foot, kind of a mouth. And that's, uh, so this kind of first is establishing what kind of, you know, in, in sensations the objects had in that space and also trying to articulate what it's like to be on Zoom, what it's like to be connecting or performing in that space. And the reindeer was the most interesting one, the little reindeer the one in there because He's like, you know, looking from one corner and then moving to the back corner and then looking from every direction. And then then finally, the at the end says, try not to look at anything, but definitely, definitely don't look at the camera. So it's kind of acknowledging the camera and the view like you were talking about earlier, but not, not acknowledge, like this kind of like, you know, like a distrust of the camera and the gaze of the camera. And so those were the kind, I did that with all of the objects I kind of imagined what kind of relationship they would have and to the space and what it was like and how it affected them. And I think the very last one was the bear and the rabbit at the very end because they were very, you know, there was a real tenderness or tension there too. And one of them says, I'm aware that you were beside me. I know that you were there and I know that you were looking out and I know that you were moving closer together and I really want to be in the same space. I can turn and I can almost see you. And then at the very end they say, if I disappear and you disappear, there's this kind of ending of the whole experience in the, in the space. So that's how I, I, I took those little kind of listening sessions and then created the kind of uh, tone of the oscillator, using the oscillator and the voice and layering it. So it was a really, uh, really magical experience for me just you know, listening to those objects and looking at the work you had done and, and trying to bring a kind of a sound and a voice, but it's a, it captures a relationship to the space and to each other. Yeah, so that was kind of how I approached it. Beautiful. Yeah, it, uh, the thing is, is that is that it is it is magic now. <laughs> like it it is, and and uh, and you you that's down to you. You saw that, and you put sound to it. <laughs> it's just thank you. Lovely. Yeah. Yeah, it's kind of like you gave a backstory to the objects that we were <laughs> that we were manipulating. Uh, but we, as of course, we we all share a kind of fondness for objects and the yeah. and the um, and their backstories yes. and their and their potentials and and their inner monologues that. Mm -hmm. uh, you know that we're not party to, mm -hmm. so it's it, it's really touching to hear you um, describe that as part of your working process. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I think that, that, that giving them a sense of agency and and uh, yeah, sensitive to them and not wanting them to suffer is like a sensitivity for all plants and animals and objects. And, yeah. yeah, yeah, suffer by going to Value Village. Yeah. <laughs> Being sent to valuability. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Hi, Thomas. Hi. So it's it's just my pleasure to introduce the the last and uh, equally you, magical collaborative collaborator here, uh, Jeff Morton. Uh, so we'll be viewing his clip uh, now. Okay. <laughs>
Hi, Johanna. Hi, Judith. Hi, Jeff. Hi, Jeff. Thank you for being here. Yeah. <laughs> My pleasure. Yeah. Probably yeah. from a blizzard. Well, it's going to get here. Yeah. So they mm -hmm. say. Um, so I'm here in the southeast corner of Saskatchewan. This is Treaty 2, land of the Anishinaabe, Cree, Oji Cree, Assiniboine, Dakota, and Dene peoples, and traditional homeland of the Métis Nation. Uh, rural Saskatchewan, very lucky to have fiber internet out on an acreage, so I can join you from uh, my kitchen in mid-renovation. Uh, I've got counters now, but uh, no walls. <laughs> well, I've got walls, but they're not finished. And you're in a sod house, right? Well, it is, uh, it, well, it is an eco house. Uh, okay. Not properly sod, though. Okay. No, it's built into the side of a hill, south-facing some of those uh, green techniques that people developed uh, well probably a long time ago but when my dad built it was more of a dream from the 60s and 70s right right yeah so so the final i i think of your piece as the final piece i mean it really does seem to to kind of be that um i hope people watch the entirety of it it's it's the longest piece that we did it's about 12 minutes long. Um, but at the time, this was after almost a year and a half of in and out of lockdowns. And and um, we'd already started some of the other Zoom collaborations. Uh, and But we were still piecing together this footage and making this footage. Um, and I'm not sure where the idea came from. Judy, do you? remember well i think we were sitting there and and went well oh why don't we go outside and then and then it was like well why don't we see if we can go down the street and then it was like i wonder how far zoom will let us go <laughs> and yeah. and i wonder when the wife when it will stop when it will just die but it never did die it just froze um yeah that's kind of where it came from we were just like that's where it seems like that's where all of the things we've done have come from. It's like, whoa, what about, what would happen if, and we were talking about the smoke bushes, I think. We both have smoke bushes outside our, our front doors. So we're like, oh, let's go outside. Yeah, so we, we really wanted to try to push those limits, the technological limits that seem to be yeah. um, really <laughs> starting to be annoying, you know, after so many Zoom collaborations and conversations and meetings and panels and uh, and they continue. Um, but yeah, we wanted to see if we could stretch, stretch the, how far we could stretch the Wi-Fi. Mm -hmm. And then um, we unexpectedly, uh, the Zoom algorithm decided to take over the editing once we reached the kind of the limits of the, of, of I don't know what it was, the range. Well, I, I guess the, the, the limits of the Wi-Fi. <clears throat> and so then Zoom, the Zoom algorithm itself decided that it needed to kind of fill in some gaps and do some edits and make some uh, but we were just trying to, we were not trying, we were pacing ourselves in such a way. And we had by then worked together for, for long enough that our sense of timing was, was uh, pretty innate. Uh, so we walked out and then returned. And then we wanted to see if we couldn't see each other. We're in different ends of the country or I'm in, <laughs> Judy's at one end, I'm in the middle, um, not to exclude the East Coast. Um, uh, you know, we wanted to see if we could, would, would return, if Zoom would pick us up again and we, we would return and, and sit down at the same time again. So that's the point where then we are going like, would you be interested in working with us footage, Jeff. So 
Yeah. There's a lot there that re I really responded to. On one hand, I've, I've spent so much of uh, my artistic practice focusing on um, broken machines, uh, glitch aesthetics, you know, uh, ways of making sound or, you know, media art as well. That's somehow about like the technology itself not functioning in the way it's intended to be functioning uh -huh. or intended to be used. So I, I really, I responded very quickly to that. And then also through the experience of time in this piece and the many repetitions, I think five in total mm -hmm. um, that you that you do together and how each has the same premise, but a different outcome and different details. The way that the screen freezes as well is, is such a powerful moment in each one. And those way, and the way that that became like an iterative structure um, repeating and uh, I, I can get really lost in those kinds of uh, time-based pieces. Yeah. So I really appreciated that as well. Yeah, it's beautiful. One of the things that, uh, you know, we uh, I think at a certain point, we ask for a slight change and you were and you were going like, well, this is what I'm doing. And so does it make sense to make this change? And so you shared the score with us. And I wonder if we if we could actually see that score. Sure. Yeah, I think. Uh, yeah, Eric can put that up. So Eric can um, put it up so can, is, and we um, can talk over it. Right. So can you yeah. describe the elements? Absolutely. So so this is a screenshot of the. Um, composition in the audio editing program that I'm using. The top line is the pedal steel guitar recording. Uh, that's There's no breaks in that. That was a one take, just a, a performance in response to watching the video in real time and performing along with it. Below that in the light green is the Zoom audio. That's the audio from your recordings. And you see that there are pieces cut out of that. They correspond two lines down to pieces cut out of a white noise track as well in the background. And in between those, um, the other, the topmost um, darker green there, that is a keyboard. Oh, well, not a keyboard precisely, a synthesizer um, creating those whistle tones. And the bottom track is trumpet. So uh, those were the instruments that I used to build this. And, and you can see the compositional structure then, the five repetitions, the way that the trumpet comes in only when those other two tracks go away. And those breaks in the sound correspond to moments when one of your video feeds is frozen. So those moments are marked in the sound as well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And there's a there's this um, elasticity to it, to the sound. Like there's a tension and elasticity. It's kind of like it feels like it's like it gets somewhere and then it gets it gets pulled back. Something there. There's I really feel that when I hear it as well i mean because we were trying to escape um but we kept getting pulled back <laughs> and so there's a, and it's kind of there's a little bit of um eeriness to it but at the same time the instruments are are um there's a there's almost a, a i wouldn't say it, it's not melodic but it has a, a really a harmonic quality to it that as well we were talking about it being like a boomerang. Judy. Yeah, yeah, that's what it felt. It's like well, when it comes back, and yeah. Nice. I'm really um, interested in your choice of instruments in pedal steel and trumpet, which I don't know for some reason I feel like I don't, I don't think about the trumpet much when I think about video soundtracks <laughs> for some reason. I don't know why that is, but uh, can you talk about that? I think, um, well, these are the, the instruments I have at hand. I have been developing work for um, pedal steel guitar in a few different ways. Some of that is singing old country music uh, to small crowds of people sometimes. Other times it's uh, more sort of performance art or media art installation kind of work with sounds created on the instrument. And in this case, uh, I guess it's closer to the second. Uh, playing trumpet all along with that or singing, these are, these are some other experiments I've been doing. I think what really drew me to the pedal steel guitar is the famili familiarity of the sound and it's, it's, it's got a musical quality in that first, that first sound, the first moment of the video. Uh -huh. um, there's like a, a strum in effect. Mm -hmm. That's the pedal, uh -huh. uh, one of the pedals on the pedal steel guitar being pushed down that causes mm -hmm. that sound, a very bright sound. And I think there's uh, just a lot of sort of information packed into that sound for, for lots of folks. And so I like that, that musicality that's in mm -hmm. a sound even more than in a series of sounds that represent music. 
The trumpet, likewise, I was attracted to for its musicality, for its reference to, you know, to music, but the heralding quality of a trumpet, the trumpet exactly. can be heard over a great distance. And that being a theme in your work as well, uh, made me think that that was uh, in those moments where the screen was frozen and we've lost one of you. And it's this calling sound, uh, not nothing particularly prolific about my trumpet playing, but even just a few, a few notes uh, brings that quality out, I think. Yeah, beautiful. Mm -hmm. Yeah, really. I love pedal steel guitar. It's, you know, if you had to say a say favorite inter instrument, it might be up there in my favorite instruments for sure. It's such a it's a it's a beautiful combination. You know, the, the, yeah, it really is. It's unexpected. Okay. Yeah, talk a bit about responding to the repetition how did how did because you know one might be tempted to kind of ignore that and just kind of keep going but but mm -hmm. you you know there's this beautiful cadence that's built up yeah i think what that was one of the things that first jumped out at me was this capacity to create a composition that was in effect five versions of itself um and mm -hmm. the, the differences in each of the repetitions would be the thing that sort of drew me back into the piece, into the moment of its performance um, and, you know, editing and so forth as well, just to sort of pull out those differences. We did talk in our exchange about how sounds would map to the video and r keeping sounds from the original Zoom call in there as well. So there are the sounds of the door, you know, the screen doors opening and closing, those latches and so forth that really ground you back into the moment of the piece. Uh, through those repetitions and it was uh, very much on my mind not to attach you know direct sounds with direct events with the exception of one well two two places really in my mind there are always accidental you know moments where sounds and, and visuals align and and you can you can make that association but for me uh, you know in creating the piece I made an effort to only um, have events sound and visual events line up in the last repetition on the opening of the screen door and the closing of the screen door. So as you're right. departing and then as you're returning, there are two strums right. on the guitar that match those precisely. Yeah. And it may just be that I've spent so much time with the work, but that, that for me is a very interesting effect when that happens if for the first time and you feel that the sound has been always linked to the video, but it's in that moment that it's really, it really hits you. Yeah. Brilliant. Yeah. yeah. Okay, Thomas is back. Yeah, thanks so much. That was a really great discussion. And now I'm, I'm really happy that we can open it up to uh, everyone here who's uh, joined us online. Um, what I wanted to do is just start with one question for uh, everyone. I really liked what you mentioned, uh, John and Judith, about uh, how long uh, Zoom will let us go. And I wanted to think about that a bit, like uh, for everyone uh, in your work, how... Um, how long has Zoom let you go and how far are you pushing it now? I kind of think of Zoom as the, the sort of the new relationship performance has had with the camera and like what, uh, how, how's this project and maybe other projects you've been uh, working on uh, pushed with or against Zoom? You have to watch all of the episodes and answer that question for yourself. A lot of time. <laughs> Um, uh, anyone? Anyone else but me? Well, you know, it was also there was also the PSI Zoom one that we did using the the green screen and stuff that was not working and working and that kind of well, it was like oh okay that's something else that that you know I kind of dabbled a bit with but yeah it just. It, it wasn't, it wasn't, it was just like, oh, well, maybe that'll work. Or why don't we try this? Or, you know, it just, it's like, we know what that's about. We know what that Zoom thing is. We all know, we all know where, like, we're, we're somewhere. Um, I was saying to Johanna yesterday, <laughs> I'm starting to babble, but I was saying that um, it, it's like, it's, it's sort of like where we are and when we are, uh, but, but we, but we're not. <laughs> either. So I started to get a little bit. I'll stop now. <laughs> uh, 
For um, me, uh, oh, sorry. Go ahead. I was going to ask if others had. Well, the one one thing, like even today, um, breaking that wall, like the you know, sending the teacup from Victoria to Toronto, is quite an amazing, you know, kind of breaking down some of that aspects of Zoom and throwing the tomato and those little beautiful things. And also, there's also criticality of lo looking at its limits and then containing the performance intentionally within those limits. So I think you two are already doing a lot of really interesting things. Well, I, I also want to say that we never would have been able to collaborate with all of you if it mm -hmm. hadn't been for this damn pandemic and, yeah. Yeah. and coinciding with the availability of Zoom. It just probably wouldn't have happened in this, this way. So that's, that's huge um, to actually meet people for the first time and to collaborate across such vast distances I'd, I'd still love to make it to Saskatchewan one day, <laughs> not today, but, um, or tomorrow, but, uh, but, you know, definitely one day, uh, to it, because it does produce this longing for actually mm -hmm. wanting to meet people in person and to, to really, you know, break through this piece of plastic. Mm -hmm. Uh, and, and, uh, but also I think the fact that all of you are also performers and collaborators and, and perhaps more than, uh, you know, I mean, the pandemic lockdowns were pretty tough on, on us because of course we had no, no venues, no relationships, no concerts, no open art openings. <clears throat> and so this was, this was the way we could do that and to, 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 um, to work together. I think something else you mentioned that I really like was rubberizing the computers. And, uh, <laughs> I mean, like, I, I really appreciate that we're all in our, our kitchens here and uh, all this, but yeah, just to, to give it a bit more of that, that bend um, together. So I'm, maybe we can sort of brainstorm a bit about what, what a rubberized computer or what a rubberized space could look like. <laughs> yeah, well, I like the riskiness of actually having my computer balanced on a pot here next to the sink. Yeah. Uh -huh. You know, there's something about the frisson of having this, you know, piece of vulnerable electronics around plugs and blenders and microwaves that anything might happen. So, um, and, and carrying carrying it around around and and then carrying it outside and up the street and 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 not being able to see where you're going down steps and it's like yeah if it were rubber it would there wouldn't be that it would be like boing, whatever <laughs> yeah good idea Johanna <laughs> I got a million of them <laughs> yeah. Jay, what what have you been able to do via Zoom that you might not I mean, have done? I've done a couple different like residency type things over Zoom throughout the pandemic um, that were really good, but also afterwards made me feel a little bit like I don't want to be on Zoom ever again, <laughs> just for the amount of time spent. On Zoom, I can usually last maybe about a couple hours, yeah, and then then it's too much. Yeah, it's exhausting. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, oh, sorry, Thomas, go ahead. No, please, please, please go ahead. Well, I was just going to say we had thought that we might uh, stretch the limits of Zoom again yeah. and try to do some kind of live jam which of course i'm not a musician <laughs> so i'm just going to give the countdown but that was the the idea is that um uh that we will start playing um audience members this is it we're going to say goodbye uh, uh we're not going to come back to spoken word again unless somebody wants to start. Um, 
And uh, yeah, we're going to play for like, I don't know, 10 or 15 minutes. So you're welcome to stay. I'm going to, I'm going to count us down here. <laughs>
Thank <laughs> you. 